Hi, and welcome. I'm Arwa Shobiki, Managing Director for the Project on Middle East Democracy, and I'd like to thank you all for joining our panel today to discuss Jordan. On Monday, Jordan's King Abdullah II will meet with President Biden at the White House. Typically, such a visit wouldn't attract much attention, but this first meeting between the two leaders comes at a moment of escalating repression, political instability, and economic decline in the kingdom. In April, many of us were shocked to hear the news of arrests linked to an alleged coup in Jordan and Prince Hamza bin Hussein's subsequent and continued house arrest. While the facts behind the April arrests and closed door trial and convictions remain unknown, in truth, problems have been mounting since at least 2011. And Jordanians have consistently been calling for an end to rampant corruption, for job creation, and for a more empowered representative government. Yet instead of leading any meaningful reform, King Abdullah has cycled through seven prime ministers, three rounds of parliamentary elections, and empty reform initiatives that have changed nothing for the common Jordanian. The COVID-19 pandemic has also taken a heavy toll on Jordan's economy and population, with 750,000 confirmed cases and at least 10,000 dead out of a population of only 10 million. Nearly 40% of Jordanians live in poverty, and unemployment is at a record 25%. As we all know, King Abdullah has great support here in Washington. Jordan is now the second largest recipient of US bilateral aid in the world after Israel, receiving more than 1.5 billion annually, and since 2015, more than 1 billion in, addition, in additional military aid from the Defense Department. This aid comes with no real reform strings attached. Such a deep and long-standing financial investment ought to provide the United States with leverage to incentivize real reform in Jordan before further instability and decline ensue. But so far, the Biden administration has not shown any interest in pressing the king to change course. I'm here today with three exceptional panelists to explore Jordan's political, domestic political issues and discuss what steps the Biden administration and Congress may be able to take to help address these issues. I'd like to first welcome Besma Motmani, joining us from Canada, where she's a professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and a leading expert on the Middle East. Also joining us today is Curtis Ryan, professor of political science at Appalachian State University and a leading Jordan expert here in the US. And finally, Sean Yom, associate professor of political science at Temple University and a specialist on Arab monarchies, authoritarian politics and their implications for US foreign policy. Thank you all for joining us today and welcome. We'll start today's discussion with a question for each of you on Jordan's domestic situation and then shift our focus to US policy toward Jordan. We'll ask audience questions next. So please, if you're watching and listening, submit a question if you have one through the Q&A button on Zoom or email us at communications at pomed.org. Besma, I'd like to start with you and ask you to give us your thoughts on the alleged coup plot and recently concluded closed door trial of Jordan's former finance minister and chief of the Royal Court, Bassem Awadullah and Royal family member, Sharif Bin Zaid. On Monday, the state security court handed them each 15 year sentences for sedition and incitement. What do you make of the trial and the verdict? And what about Prince Hamza and his continued extrajudicial house arrest? Has this weakened or strengthened him in the eyes of the Jordanian public? And how much does that matter? Please go ahead. Thanks, Arwan, and thanks um, to Pomet for the invitation. And I'm, I'm humbled to be actually with real joining experts, uh, Curtis and Sean, who have far written more on this than I have. Um, so, I mean, I guess I think, you know, to your question, I mean, the, the whole plot has been, uh, or the alleged coup, coup plot has been really quite mysterious and clouded by a lot of uncertainties, uh, you know, leaks that are coming out here and there. I think rumors certainly have been circulating throughout, as you said, it's a very small country and small population. Um, you know, I would say generally, um, you know, there's not a lot of sympathy for Awadullah. I mean, certainly he has those folks who do see him as, you know, indeed a reformer. But, you know, he came with so much economic pain during his tenure that generally speaking, you know, sadly, his name is, is associated with corruption and a great deal of mismanagement that happened in the country. And so I think there's an overall you know, satisfaction, right? It's it's sort of, you know, seeing, uh, you know, a big man in the, in the country being taken down. So, you know, it's there, there is a bit of, I think, a celebration, if you will, um, of his arrest. Um, I think the, the, 
the other royal was a really unknown commodity generally. I mean, not he wasn't really popular or well known. So I think it's a bit interesting too to see the same kind of uh, sentencing given to both. Uh, you know, 15 years of hard labor. Even just saying hard labor again, you can just see the optics of it. It really is about sort of you know in the interest of of the. Uh, you know, the, the little guy, if you will. So I think there is a lot of support for this. Um, as to the accusations and the whole plot, you know, it's just, it doesn't add up in my humble view. It seems really weird. Uh, in many ways, the, the, the base of uh, Awadallah does not match the, the, the base of Hamza, which is to me the, the most, I think, uh, clear, um, you know, kind of disconnect with all of this. It doesn't make sense. I mean, even just being as, as imaginative as one can be to see, you know, Awadullah in the company of Hamza just doesn't make sense. Again, you know, Hamza is seen as a person who understands the tribes, the Transjordanians, quite literally sits down with them on the floor, you know, has a way of mannerism and speaking that is very comfortable to the tribes, whereas Awadullah is your cosmopolitan banker um, and seen in the kind of, you know, Davos uh, circles. So they just don't match. And so trying to put this plot together has been always very odd. But I mean, I think generally speaking, um, you know, there are core believers in this plot. Certainly, Jordanian intelligence certainly believes it, and, and people in the national security sector. Um, and I suspect that uh, they are sharing intelligence with the Americans to convince them. So I can't really, you know, as a person who doesn't have access to that kind of information, I can't really, you know, just say whether or not it's a valid accusation. But I would say, as an outsider, it just doesn't add up. And then many Jordanians on the ground are still perplexed. Um, they don't really buy it. Um, and so the government either has to really give the Jordanian public enough of a smoking gun to convince them, uh, which they haven't, um, or just, you know, really kind of uh, assume that, um, you know, just leave it as is, which is what I think they're trying to do. Now, of course, Hamza is, uh, you know, under house arrest. We haven't heard from him. Uh, we saw a brief picture of him with his brother uh, praying over um, his uh, their father's grave. But generally speaking, we haven't really seen a lot from Hamza, obviously, except those two leaked videos. Um, and from that, those two videos, he's gotten a lot of a lot of popularity. People, you know, see him as, again, a person who understands, you know, what the little guy's feeling and the socioeconomic challenges of the average Jordanian is, is pretty immense. And it, it seems weird, right, to have a royal kind of heavily, having that populist role and sympathy with the average person. But I think he did it so eloquently that his popularity likely increased. Um, and I think most people still don't buy um, the so-called sedition plot. So I think he's escaped this, uh, not completely unscathed because those who certainly believed it uh, do feel that you know something has to be done about, about Hamza as a potential internal threat. Uh, but I'd say overall, uh, quietly Jordanians are saying that um, you know, they don't believe Hamza is a part of this. Great, thank you. Sean, I'd like to switch to you and ask you, in the widely publicized video released by Prince Hamza's lawyer in April, amid unclear allegations against the prince for conspiring to undermine the government, Prince Hamza called out the incompetence, corruption, and mismanagement by the governing structure, as well as the loss of faith Jordanians have in their institutions and the fear many have of arrest and harassment should they express their frustrations. This and the later leaked audio recording um, that Besma just referenced uh, of the confrontation between the Prince and the Chief of the General Staff resonated deeply with many Jordanians. Can you unpack this for us a little bit? And why do these criticisms resonate among, among Jordanians? And how have these issues become worse in recent years? Uh, yes, that's that's a great question. Uh, and like Besma, I want to thank Pomet for inviting me to uh, speak here today and also it's always a pleasure to speak on any panel with with Kurt uh, and obviously with uh, with Besma as well. Um, I think this question is important because it emphasizes the I think that the the, re, that the meaningful intersection between the so-called Hamza affair and the broader terrain of social discontent that we've seen roiling Jordan for much of the past two decades um, under King Abdullah. Uh, I would say that I think the Western media, uh, you know, for better or for worse, gave the, the, the palace intrigues and the political maneuverings about um, the Hamza incident and the role of Bassam Awadullah, of other high-ranking figures, former officials, other elites who were connected to the whole entourage that they initially arrested or detained, 
I think the attention given to that affair is predictable because I think the Western media likes to focus on pretty high level political issues that seem to implicate the stability of an ally like Jordan. Um, but I think the intersection with social discontent was apparent precisely because, as you mentioned, Hamza was particularly well known among not just certain Transjordanian communities and, tri and, and, and tribal voices, but because he, among all the royals that we know of uh, over the past few years, at least, because uh, there have been instances in the past, but of the past few years, has most explicitly called out uh, issues of corruption and mismanagement and incompetence and abuses of power uh, within, uh, you know, by the Jordanian state. And I think the reason that resonates for many Jordanians, and not just Jordanians of particular tribal origin, but many young Jordanians in particular, is that we know that the frequency of popular grievance from all quarters across Jordanian society has re uh, risen remarkably uh, even since the Arab Spring, uh, and it's not always shown by the level of public mobilization. Uh, news headlines tend to center in with a laser focus on protests and other episodes of loud, visible contentiousness. But we have good public survey evidence that, that, that highlights that even when there are no protests happening, that a good majority of society really does think that their country is being chronically mismanaged. So as evidence, I can just recite a few numbers from the latest wave of the Arab barometer, uh, the, the pan-regional survey in the Arab world undertaken by a consortium of American universities and institutions. And its most recent pre-COVID results from 2018 and 19, we found out the following pretty sobering statistics about the beliefs and attitudes of Jordanians. So in 2018 and 19, the Arab barometer found only 38% of Jordanians trust the government, which is down from 66% in 2011. Only about 50% of Jordanians believe the right to express free opinions is modestly or strongly guaranteed, which is down from 71% in 2011. We know as well, most Jordanian journalists practice some form of self-censorship to avoid punishment. Nearly 77% of Jordanians today, or at least in 2018 and 19, see the economic situation as bad or very bad. And that's far higher than the 56% who answered the same in 2011. 86% believe the government was failing to create enough job opportunities. And a whopping 89% believe that corruption was widespread, which is far higher than the 66% we saw in, in, in 2011. So keep in mind, this is all pre-COVID. So if, if, we, if, we've, if we've discovered anything from COVID, the, the COVID pandemic, it's that if there were pre-existing social or economic problems in a country before a pandemic paralyzed everything, the pandemic doesn't make those better it tends to aggravate and make, make, make those things worse. So we know, for instance, that right now, youth unemployment in Jordan, which was at about 37 to 38% in 2019, is now estimated at about 50%. So essentially, if you're between the ages of 16 and 28, and you are seeking a job in Jordan, you're probably, one out of two of you are not going to get a job. So to put this in global perspective, Jordan is now one of the three worst countries in the world for getting a job if you happen to be between the ages of 16 and 28. Only There are only two other countries with higher youth unemployment rates. That's Libya and South Africa. So I know that these are a lot, these are a lot of data and these are a lot of attitudes and views to, to, to absorb at once. Um, and I don't mean to connote that Jordanians are united in all their grievances. Jordanians are diverse. They have different identities. They have different ideologies. They don't organize in the same way. Not all protest when they're unhappy. Um, and they don't all have the same demands made upon the government. But if you look at results like these from credible public surveys, it's difficult to walk away with anything but the conclusion that if nothing else, a majority of Jordanians think that there are some severe social, economic, and political shortcomings regarding how their country is being managed and governed. Or that should be indisputable. And they don't always focus on the same issues, but certain ones keep on coming up when you talk to activists, when you listen to protests, when you read social media, issues of corruption, for instance, issues of abuses of power, issues of 
the wrong people having decision-making authority and not being able to make the right kinds of decisions which are attuned to the social and economic needs of the lower income communities and the middle classes that make up the vast majority of society. And so I think that if we take these common opinions, what we might call the street of Jordan, then we get, I think, that powerful intersection between the Hamza affair and the terrain of social discontent and grievance. That when Hamza, a member of the royal family, is explicitly invoking the same issues that we know empirically most Jordanians have uttered, talked about, protested against, or invoked in some form of private or public discussion, that matters. Right? That's, that's what makes this agenda for potential change and reform so important. That's what makes it also so urgent, given the degree of, I think, dissatisfaction that we've proven to exist among so much of society. Thank you. That's a perfect segue for, um, for, for my next question for, uh, for Curtis. Um, as someone that has closely studied Jordan and Jordanian political movements, what changes have you seen on the ground in Jordan the past two years in terms of grassroots popular movements and demands? Electoral laws, gerrymandering, and carefully designed parliaments have played an important role in dividing Jordanian society in the past. For example, urban versus rural, East Banker versus West Banker, et cetera. Can Jordanians overcome these societal divisions and unify around a common cause for reform? And if so, what specific type of reforms would be most likely to serve as unifying in this way? Okay. Um, yeah, that's good questions. Uh, and also I wanna thank POMED for having me. It's uh, great to be on here with you, Arwa, and always great to see you, Basma and Sean. Um, so I'm gonna follow up on their comments and uh, 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 especially along the lines of what's, what's different here. Um, in the last 10 years, especially, um, we've just seen so much change. You know, 2011 was really quite exciting. Um, for, for a lot of people um, that, you know, protests is certainly not new to, to Jordanian politics and demonstrations are not new to Jordanian politics. Um, but one of the things that struck me as, as new and different was uh, relatively new actors entering the, the public stage in Jordanian public life. So we had sort of traditional versions of opposition um, showing up, um, the political parties, which are not significantly strong in Jordan, but nonetheless are traditionally part, or at least many of them, are traditionally part of opposition, left-wing parties, pan-Arab nationalist parties, things like that. And certainly the Islamist movement in its various forms um, were, were active at various times. But the unique part to me was uh, the Hirak uh, phenomenon, um, uh, emerging of, of the movements, popular movements that developed. Um, and I think we're already, you know, just a few years later, already this is getting kind of muddied where uh, people are thinking of that as, as a couple different things, mainly because I, I think it really was originally a couple different things. There was a Hirak movement in the sense of any form of popular movement, the labor movements that were organizing down in Aqaba, down in the South um, to the attempt to get a teacher's union underway or the way it was used more specifically, I think, especially in 2011, 12, et cetera, of youth popular movements. And that was a unique part where it seemed like there was literally no corner of Jordan that didn't have its own popular youth movement pop up, um, starting with Biban and then moving on to other parts of the country. Um, these are all in various degrees still part of Jordanian politics. It's just not, we're not in the days of the Arab Spring anymore. And then this, uh, so we've seen lots of changes, more restrictions on protest and certainly on freedom of speech and so on. Um, we've seen also shifts in strategy on the ground. Um, and then of course the pandemic uh, hit. So that changed a lot of things. So I think what it's interesting is when when that, these doors start opening up again, where, where do things go when when the pandemic starts to recede to the extent that it can and so on, where, where do we go from here? But I wanna echo something that, that Sean just mentioned about um, what, you know, what are people actually talking about? The, the thing that really stood out to me about the protests uh, and, and demands for reform was that uh, wh whatever the motivating factor was, whether it was pro-democracy movements or tax revolt or anger about price increases or subsidies being withdrawn, any protests in the last 10 years, say, um, they, they are coming from different directions. Sometimes it's politically motivated. Sometimes it seems to be economically motivated. Uh, and my, my suggestion would be the mistake is when people like leave it at that and see any of these as unicausal. 
because it, it's hard for me to find a Jordanian protest or social movement or activist movement that doesn't fairly quickly branch out. If it started economically, it gets to politics almost immediately. If it started politically, they're bringing in the economics almost immediately. And every single one of them uh, at, at one point or another, we'll talk about corruption is the single most common complaint in Jordanian public life. And it has been for a really long time, um, which is why, and I'm gonna echo uh, uh, my colleague uh, Besma here as well. Um, that's why there was the, the reaction I think to Awadullah went as it is. In fact, the only, um, and to his conviction, what the only, there was considerable skepticism as she correctly pointed out. Um, and also I think disappointment that they, there are a lot of people who were not sympathetic to him, but uh, thought he should be tried for completely different reasons, but they would think of as economic issues. And because of that, to bring it around to the other thrust of your question, which is social aspects and reform, um, I, I think that's why um, the answer therefore can't be whatever the reforms turn out to be, especially with this new reform committee being uh, being um, unveiled and it's gonna come up by the beginning of October with a whole slew of reforms, uh, it can't be more neoliberalism for everybody. It, it can't go back down the road of exactly what the mess was in the first place. And what almost everybody agrees is, at least to varying degrees, uh, has been part of the problem. So yeah, we've had fissures, we've had fault lines along East and West Jordanian lines and along social class lines and left and right and religious and secular and different regions of the country and so on. But it's already a small country. So to have it divided into smaller and smaller bits, it seems to me has been part of the problem. Um, and part of that is just, you know, foreign stereotyping of the country. There are people who look at Jordan and see it as this uh, entirely tribally based society and others who think it's an entirely basically de facto Palestinian society. And both of those strike me as sort of inane, silly caricatures of little tiny sliver of Jordan, which is much more complex uh, society, I think, than that. And so if there are reforms that people could actually rally around, they would have to include both the economic and political. They would have to include the anti-corruption message. If they, if, I, if if you had one word to use, I think the word would be inclusion. A lot of Jordanians who feel economically increasingly left behind. Um, and so just political reform is not going to address that, right? Um, or just dealing with um, more favorable subsidy policies and so on is not gonna uh, deal with the issue of people being worried that civil society um, is eroding and freedom of speech is going away. So if along the list of reforms, um, I expect the emphasis to be where it usually is, which is on elections and electoral laws and parties and parliament, um, which is not in and of itself terrible. It's just that that's, that can't be the end um, because most people don't support parliament, don't believe it's effective. It's not particularly powerful. Most don't join political parties and don't think they're effective anyway. I mean, most people in parliament aren't even in political parties. So the emphasis to me, it seems to me, has to be on the social safety net, uh, on the possibilities for the youth of Jordan, on job creation, and not just in Amman, and certainly not just in West Amman, and dealing with things like the cost of living and the cost of housing, which everyone who's been to Amman or lives in Amman knows uh, is comparable to well-to-do Gulf states, which is ridiculous, actually, that um, wealthy oil producing countries are the same level of expense as, as Jordan, Jordan's capital. Um, so I think if it comes around to um, reachieving basic rights for, for political activity and freedom of speech and not worrying about what you post on Facebook and whether it's gonna come back and haunt you um, or on Twitter um, or your right to organize. Um, and last point I would make about this is if, if there is gonna be a big emphasis on political parties in the new reform initiatives, which seems likely, um, that's a big uphill battle for many reasons, not just institutionally, but one of them is people have so little faith in political parties and in their experience have found that if I join a political party or I try to form a political party, I seem to be putting myself on the radar of intelligence and security services who are not cool with this idea. So the various engines of the government have to be on the same page. If you're opening the door for all this, then don't have another branch that's closing the door simultaneously. Excellent. I don't know if, if Besma or Sean, you have anything to add to that um, before we shift gears and focus a little bit more on US policy. I'd like to jump in. I mean, I couldn't agree more with Curtis. I mean, that was like a perfect masterclass on the challenges that Jordan's facing. And it goes to the point that, look, I mean, Jordan is, no, there's no shortage of neoliberalism in the country. I mean, in many ways, 
you know, it's been under IMF conditionality for more than a decade. I mean, every experimentation in the Middle East of how to make this country more pro-private sector has been tried in Jordan. So, I mean, I think the key thing, and, and going back to this feeling of, of or a, a perception of corruption, which is what we're often uh, measuring, is that there is no shortage of wealth in this country. I mean, I think you just need to go there to see that it's dripping with wealth. Um, you know, think of just Abdun, which is like the, you know, classic place where, you, you know, the elite live. I mean, you can't help but sense in the country, there's an enormous amount of wealth. It is not trickling down. And so I think the frustration among so many people, the average per person, which you noted, you know, this high youth unemployment uh, that Sean noted, these are educated young people. This is what's adding to the frustration. They've done all the right things. You've told them the neoliberal model, go out there and get degrees. They went out there, they got degrees. Your chances of getting a job with a degree is actually far lower than if you don't have a degree. I mean, that is a really sad testament to the challenges that Jordan faces in the labor market. So my point is that people are frustrated because they've been under this program of neoliberalism for so long and it's not working. It's absolutely not working. And Awadullah is absolutely, if you will, the quintessential person that advocated for all these reform policies. And people are hungrier today than before. Poverty is higher than before. Prices keep going up. Um, and the wealthier seem to get wealthier and everybody else is just suffering. So um, yeah, just added maybe a little too much to that, but um, thanks for the, for the question. Thank you. Um, so great, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here um, and turning next to US policy on Jordan, uh, you know, since the King will be visiting uh, with Biden on Monday. Since its creation, Jordan has played an important regional role absorbing waves of refugees while forging early and strategic partnerships with neighboring Israel and the United States. As a result, and to the detriment of many Jordanians, the ruling elite have grown richer and more corrupt, feeling protected and insulated from any real pressure for meaningful reform. Sean, you wrote in April on foreign policy in a widely shared article that the United States remains complicit in the economic bungling and political abuses unraveling in the country. Can you elaborate on this point, please? How is the US part of the problem? And then briefly add your thoughts as to what the Biden administration and Congress should be doing to change this. Uh, yes, so uh, I, I did write those words uh, in that piece for foreign policy, uh, and I did get plenty of angry responses <laughs> from, sir, from from some readers uh, who, um, who who accused me of having never studied Jordan. Okay, um, there is a lot to dissect. Uh, when we talk about the us Jordanian relationship. And I think the smartest way to go about it is when we think about bilateral relationships and international relations and within the broader geopolitical context of regions like the Middle East, um, we have to think about what these relationships or alliances are designed and constructed to achieve. So when you, whenever you hear Jordanian officials or American officials talk about the U.S.-Jordanian relationship, they use the term alliance. I think a better term um, uh, for, for this relationship is a patron-client relationship. Um, and by that, I mean, that, that's a little academic, but I think it's very useful in this context because it demonstrates exactly what we're talking about in terms of complicity uh, to authoritarian abuse and refusals to even remotely nudge a weaker state in a relationship towards reformist measures. So a patron-client relationship is essentially any sort of relationship of mutual dependency between two partners who have vastly unequal status. And so in this case, the patron is the United States, and it's historically, since the late 1950s, sought to bolster Jordan through dollops of diplomacy, economic aid and military assistance. And it's done so because Jordan has served various functions in America's broader Middle East grand strategy. And in turn, as is well studied, and I think we can all agree on this, Jordan needs American support to survive, particularly in terms of its financial budget and its military defenses. But it's worth parsing out what the U.S., why the U.S. has needed Jordan as a client state across generations for. Uh, why it's needed Jordan to adopt pro-Western foreign policies, why it's needed some sort of stable routine in terms of who rules Jordan 
and what those rules exactly are uh, that govern society. So in the Cold War, Jordan was an anti-communist bulwark. In the early post-Cold War decades, it became a peace partner of Israel, as you mentioned, and uh, as is uh, less talked about, uh, it was a facilitator of American war making in Iraq and the broader global and really regional war on terror as well. And uh, perhaps the least reported story of all now, but I think this is extremely important, is that the U.S. is in the process of massively expanding its military presence in Jordan, which is essentially becoming a a basically a larger version of Bahrain, um, a giant terrestrial aircraft carrier uh, and uh, a bona fide major logistical base and staging ground or a linchpin for any future war making in the region. Uh, there are a lot of uh, developments in terms of U.S. basing, uh, U.S. defense agreements being signed and U.S. technology transfers in Jordan that has made very clear that if the U.S. were to ever wage war within essentially an 800-mile radius around Amman, which extends to the Sinai, to Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, I mean, even theoretically a war in the Gulf, it would need to mobilize and use its forces in Jordan in some capacity. So Jordan is now one of the pillars of its future, I think, vision for um, its, repositioned, um, its repositioned strategy in the Middle East. So... This matters for a very important reason, uh, because history provides clear guidance whenever we talk about patron-client relationships in the international system. Whenever a great power patron needs a client state to fulfill certain strategic functions, uh, to be a bulwark against a hostile ideology, to be a loyal subordinate in the waging of war, uh, to be a reliable pillar in terms of thinking about how to reconfigure a region according to its own geopolitical interests, that great power patron, so here, the United States, has very little incentive to promote political reforms in the client state because the fear is obvious. It fears destabilizing the client. The patron wants certainty. It wants normalcy. It wants the routine created by having the same set of elites and the same regime in place for many decades. And this is why, historically speaking, the United States has almost never applied any sort of concerted pressures regarding democracy promotion to the Hashemite kingdom. Now, this is not to say that the U.S. speaks in a unified voice and the U.S. has never been critical of Jordan's domestic governance. Uh, you know, anyone who spent time in the State Department knows that it's not unusual to hear American diplomats complain very loudly about problems in Amman, particularly regarding corruption or authoritarian abuses of power. You hear this from people at the U.S. Embassy. You hear this from people in unguarded conversations and hallways outside the meeting room. But that pressure is never consistent. It never goes up the bureaucratic chain up at state, and it never becomes a talking point at the White House. And to my mind, that's the, that's the definition of American complicity. So when we have good data, robust data, that tell us the majority of a society in a client state that relies upon American aid and arms and support to subsist, when a majority of that society is clearly unhappy with how their society is being governed, right? then a powerful argument can be made that maybe long-term stability, which is in everyone's interest, could be achieved if that great power patron, the one that's asymmetrically more influential and powerful over that smaller state, should be encouraging and promoting meaningful reform, economic reforms that engage in broader redistributions of wealth, uh, political reforms that broaden the scope of democratic rights and personal and public uh, freedoms, uh, making citizens have more of a stake in how their country is governed and making them feel like their voice counts. Now, we know why the Jordanian uh, officials in Jordan, many of them at least, not all, but many of them have dragged their feet on making these reforms for many years because like all policies, backtracking on reforms, backtracking on costly policies like neoliberal economics or reversing course and meaningfully redesigning parliament to actually have a modicum of, a, of, of power to hold other institutions accountable in Jordan. Like all policies, these reforms create winners and losers. And in this case, the losers might be the ones who have a lot to lose because they 
have a preponderance of, of power now. So we have good reason to understand why there are voices in Jordan that don't want to engage in these reforms. But I think the more pertinent question is why doesn't the US, why doesn't the US or policy, why don't policy principles in the United States at least recognize that they have tools in their armory that could actually help effectuate long-term stability in Jordan, which again is in everyone's interests, uh, but in doing so would, be, would need to promote reforms in the short term, in the short to intermediate term. So some of these tools are well known to those who work in the democracy promotion industry and um, in, 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 in the broader kind of international field of development assistance. We know that, for instance, the U.S. can potentially conditionalize economic aid on policy change, on making reforms. That's never been the case in Jordan. We know that when policy principles from the United States, like people who are fairly high up the food chain over at state or officials from the White House, when they speak to their counterparts in Jordan, right, we know that they have a choice of issues to bring up. The issues can be purely strategic, like what's happening in Syria. Let's talk about our basing agreements. Uh, how are we cooperating on these strategic fronts involving intelligence or involving uh, other issues of mutual importance that they find to be urgent now? Or they can bring up the fact that most of Jordan is fairly unhappy with how their country is being governed. We have good evidence that corruption is rampant and that something has to change in a way that doesn't repeat the past because appointing a reform committee, as Curtis mentioned, to promise reforms and not deliver is a story that's been told in Jordan before. It was told in 2005 when a 27 member reform committee was appointed by the king and it never did anything. It was told in 2011 when a 52 member royal reform committee called the National Dialogue Committee was convened and ultimately made only superficial changes. And many Jordanians fear that the same is happening now. And the problem is not, again, just on the Jordanian side. If we're talking about this from the perspective of American foreign policy, we know, and I think that we want the United States as the patron of Jordan to do better, to potentially attach economic aid to attaining meaningful democratic targets which is not controversial because it's been done before for many other countries, to bring up human rights issues or corruption issues higher up on a meeting agenda rather than leaving it on the margins after all the heavy lifting is done on geopolitics for strategic collaborations. Right? But that doesn't happen. And it's for that reason why I think that there is a good degree of complicity taking place uh, within the U.S. Jordanian relationship. It doesn't have to be this way. I think things can change, but there has to be some groundswell of pressure, not just from below, but within these institutions in Washington, for I think there to be a mutual recognition that effectuating reforms will create some short-term pain, but the goal, I think, is shared. It's to make Jordan a prosperous, stable place where everyone can be happy both supporting or living within, and that's not necessarily the case now. Great, thank you. Curtis, I don't know if you wanna just build on that a little bit, um, you know, uh, what message should Biden, President Biden be giving to the king uh, on Monday? Um, I mean, you know, as, as Sean mentioned, the U.S. has a lot of tools and a lot of leverage, um, and you know the king is 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 here to sort of reset relationship um, with the U.S. administration. I think after a, a difficult four years under under Trump, um, what do you think Biden should should be communicating to the king? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because I, I think um, there are a lot of things that, as as Sean said, there usually aren't that high up the ladder in terms of getting into the weeds of the details. But I think it would be helpful if some of them were. Uh, in the Oval Office meeting, if we if they actually didn't speak just in generalities and so on, because we can be sure they're going to be talking about um, the level of security and military and defense and intelligence cooperation on all these types of things about which there's domestic controversy within Jordan, but Jordanian and, and U.S. state are basically largely on the same page. But as you said, this is also an important uh, opportunity moment um, because the previous four years, especially from the Jordanian perspective, for the previous four years were really rough. Um, Jordan is not used to being sidelined and peripheralized and marginalized like it was during the Trump years and, and really taken um, uh, uh, for granted at best, uh, even though the aid numbers were going up and the military cooperation kept going up. Um, but there was still this perception of lost political influence. So there's, here's a moment. Um, 
uh, and I, I think there too, it has to be, the emphasis should be really on uh, supporting real rather than just cosmetic reform, um, not just because the US is interested in that, but for Jordan for its own sake entirely. As Sean said, um, uh, Jordanians are so used to this. Um, this has been going, rounds of, of reform have been going on for so long that there's always the danger of just completely eliminating that word of having any real meaning anymore, right? Going back to the national charter with the 89 to 91 period of reform. And as Sean was mentioning that we had the, the mid 2000s national agenda, and there were some really good ideas in some of these packages that just weren't then implemented. And that was now 15 years ago. Uh, then the, the national dialogue committee and the whole series of reforms there. Um, and, and it's King's own discussion papers, which promised an extensive number of reforms, including parliamentary governments. So part of that, that part of that actually could be the beginning of the talking point, um, which is there are these discussion papers that lay out, you know, a set of ideas. There are multiple different reform packages and a new one on the way um, with, with a different uh, broad set of, a somewhat broad set of elites, some of whom don't really care that much about reform, but many of whom actually do and, and are trying to figure out, okay, would is this time real? You know, is this time going to really mean something? But I think everyday normal people can be forgiven. Um, Jordanian people can be forgiven if they're thinking, I've seen this movie before. I saw one, two, three. I'm not sure four is going to be any better, et cetera. So I think there has to be a deliverable this time. I hate to use a corporate term, but you know, there has to be something that, that, that shows up that, that is much more meaningful. So it's not just the cycle of crisis, which leads to reshuffle cabinet, which really leads to ousted government, which leads to new laws on elections and um, parties. And then eventually every once in a while, a kind of blue ribbon commission on reform. It has to be beyond that, like more, there's a lot of discussion. And my point is there has been some really good discussion. There've been some really good ideas. Um, and it has been common for people to say, that'd be a great idea if we actually did it, you know? So that would be the push mark would be, let's actually do it, like uh, encourage it, say that you'll have international backing, your, your ally or, or, your, or your patron, you know, will, will, will back this up if you actually go that direction. Um, but if it's going to be about parliament, then parliament itself should be a more powerful institution. I mean, most, as I mentioned earlier, most Jordanians don't belong to a party, um, have sort of a bad taste about the whole idea of parties and are, are very uncertain about them. Um, and certainly about their effectiveness. Um, so if those are gonna be on the table, then, then it has to be much more serious about making parties more meaningful and supported with no uh, intelligence service interference in them or in individuals who seek to create one or join one, uh, make parliament more powerful and a more representative institution, but one that can actually check and, balances, check and balance other institutions uh, of the state uh, and keep in mind um, that those youth data are something I think would really resonate um, actually with somebody like a Biden, actually, the, 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 the unemployment rate and things like that, I think would be something that would stick in his head anyway. And I think that would be a good idea to, to emphasize that that's got to be in there too. I think it would be entirely in character uh, in that meeting to then discuss things like the teachers union um, and getting it back to life because it was supposedly one of the great achievements of the Arab Spring period and now it's been dissolved and its leadership you know rested and so on and even protests keep getting broken up etc why not get that why not reverse that and get get it back off the ground and stop letting security institutions interfere with it for example uh, and allow people the last thing I would say is the freedom of speech part because all those are about institutions and then organizations like parties and professional associations and civil society, and then down to the individual freedom of speech issues, freedom of organization. Um, Jordan is such a techie society. Um, it was so far ahead of every other country in the entire Arab world on the internet and the, everything with the word cyber in front of it uh, and being wide open until new laws were introduced um, in 2011, 12, uh, 10, 12, 11 and 12, um, that started curbing all this for various and sundry reasons. Um, but it was once the most open area on the internet in the entire Arab world. Um, and now I think it is fair to say a lot of people worry about what they post on Facebook and everybody is on Facebook, you know, in Jordan, maybe not in the United States, but in Jordan, everybody has WhatsApp groups. Everybody has the fam on it, multiple WhatsApp chats going on. Um, many people are now on Clubhouse, uh, but also many people complain about interference across the board in those and being worried about what they said, posted, wrote. 
uh, et cetera. And that's, it, and I think it's important to bear in mind that most, I think every Jordanian I know who complains about that thinks it's fundamentally not, it's not Jordanian that, to, to approach that. So bring that back, actually. There's, a, there's just a lot of potential there that could actually be on there that Jordanians have come up with themselves. It shouldn't be anything foreign and imposed, um, but actively encouraging what Jordanians actually already came up with and have been asking for for, for many, many, many years, I think could have real positive effects. Thank you. Besma, I don't know if you'd like to add some thoughts to that. Um, I don't know what the, the view is like from, from Canada um, and in terms of Canadian engagement, um, broader engagement, what more can, can the Western powers do um, to sort of encourage these types of things that Sean and Curtis are talking about? Yeah, thank you. So let me start off with the caveat that I'm, I'm not really comfortable with, you know, the Americans being seen as somehow the moral authority on democracy right now, um, <laughs> or at all, to be honest with you. I mean, I think with all due respect, again, as a Canadian, I, I can tell you that we're not comfortable with that. So uh, we have to be a little, uh, I think, modest, uh, let's be honest. Um, and let me say something else. I think Jordanians are generally very critical of it, people's intentions and foreign policy intentions. And I hate to say this, but if you had a poll out there and asked the average Jordanian, you know, is it in the US interest to have more Jordanian democracy? They'd say no. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, let's, let's be very frank here. Again, they're not seen as, again, the moral authority on democracy. So whatever comes out of the US, I mean, if anybody's listening from you know, the State Department, I'm really sorry, but you're not, you're not dealing with an audience that sees this, um, you know, the, these policies in an uncritical light. But let's move on. It was a beautiful description of this musical chairs of reform. You know, you can see how the word reform, um, Jordanians are jaded, right? They just don't believe it's real. It's a delay tactic. You know what I mean? Give it a decade. How many more committees can you bring? You know, okay, this tribe complains, bring one person from this tribe. I mean, Jordanians are really good at, you know, keeping this great uh, aura of, of modernization and democratization without really moving the needle. So um, it is frustrating. And to the point of the teacher syndicate, I mean, you know, like I have a lot of family who are teachers in the public system and, it, you know, they're paid peanuts in a public system with dilapidated, you know, infrastructure, classrooms where there's no heat. You know, these guys are not the ones you want to be, you know, imprisoning and breaking up. These are the people who are teaching your kids, you know, the fundamentals. Now, I know the public system doesn't isn't great with education and, and most people, if you can afford it, are going to a private system, but that's not a that's not a excuse to sideline it. It's actually a, a, an indication of investment. So I think you know we should do more to support the teachers. And if you're again, if you're going to if you're gonna really, you know, um, talk the, you know, talk the talk, whatever, uh, and walk the walk, you're gonna have to do something about that and, and get back um, these kinds of unions and syndicates um, back up and running and really be sincere about having them. Uh, play an active role in society. So, I mean, on things that can be done from U.S. Uh, and Western uh, aid agencies and bilateral aid, I mean, I would focus on anything that's jobs, 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 jobs. I mean, really, truly and utterly. Everything else has, you know, been tried and been given. There's no need to give them more advice on exchange rate, more advice on this. They need jobs. Um, so if you really want to help, if the Americans really want to help, you know, American companies, you know, there are a lot of them are very much in the tech space, back to, you know, Curtis's point, you know, there's young people, you couldn't get a more hyper-connected society, relatively speaking, they, they speak, you know, English really well. I mean, this is what I would love to see is actually, you know, American companies taking a true interest and benefiting from the demographic dividend that the country has of young, educated, hyper-connected, relatively pro-Western. I mean, you can do more, I think, in that space. And that is not just you know, incumbent on the American government. Uh, that really re re requires some sort of you know, trilateral relationship with the private sector. Um, lastly, women, uh, women in jobs. I mean, I think you know, 60% of women are in uh, the labor market. Um, and this is not all due to a lack of wanting a job. Women give up, they're highly educated. And it's a loss. It's an absolute loss to a society to have 16%, only 16% of its uh, women, uh, you know, labor market um, participation. So a lot more can be done there. More investment in trades, uh, education-wise. There's, you know, way too many doctors, way too many engineers. We need trades, and we need to start doing more about highlighting the great value of trades. Um, and that's certainly, I think, something that the college system in the U.S. community colleges can be more active in. So I mean, I think there's lots to do. 
Um, I don't think I need to, see, personally, I don't think I want to see more heavy hand from the Americans on, you know, lecturing the Jordanians on democracy. They want to make democracy flourish. They need to help with the context of the country is suffering financially and people have lost hope. Uh, you know, poor people aren't your worry. If we're talking about the street, it's not that. It's the discrepancy between the rich and poor that makes people frustrated. And this country does not lack wealth. That is what is really making the country so difficult, I think, politically, is that people look around and they know someone is winning, someone is gaining from this system, but it's not the average person, despite your education, despite your, um, you know, so-called, uh, you know, doing all the right things and getting the education. So I think there's a lot more that can be done on the development side. I'd rather see that be the emphasis of, of Biden. Um, it's not to shortchange the, the, the great proposals being said about, you know, actually making these reforms, not just, uh, I, mean, I love the idea of deliverables, that'd be great. I mean, it can, it can be done as a part of this as well, but I do hope there's more in the investment space because I think that's where the Jordanians will benefit most. Excellent, thank you so much, um, super insightful. We've got about seven minutes and a lot of questions. So maybe we could do kind of like a speed round. Um, I'll ask, uh, I'll try and get through maybe three or four questions and just ask for sort of brief, um, brief responses from you. Um, the first one is interesting. What do you think, um, what, do, what in your view is the main reason why repression in Jordan in recent years has gotten worse? Um, why does the king feel the need to rule in an increasingly intolerant and exclusionary manner? I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Um, who wants to, wants to tackle that? I mean, I think the repression in the entire region has gone up. And so the Jordanians just feel like there's, or the Jordanian government feels like there's more green lighting of that, right? It's everywhere you turn around, it's the story is not good. Uh, you know, whether it's journal, journalists being, um, you know, arrested, digital authoritarianism in the region is on the rise. Uh, certainly, um, again, self-censorship, it, it's, it's endemic now in the region. It's part of what maybe it is the Arab winter, post-Arab spring, but I think this, overall uh, regional climate of added repression has given, I think the Jordanians uh, government some view that, you know, it's, it's not going to be opposed in the same way as it was before. Thank you, Basma. Um, there's a question here about the security services, which we haven't talked about, but has been alluded to, their role has been alluded to several times in different responses. Um, this question is, given the role of the security services in closing the door to genuine reform, what about, this, what about security sector reform? Um, is that something that can be taken seriously in Jordan? Um, can it be thought of as a key precondition to genuine political and economic reform? Um, and what are the challenges maybe to that? I don't know if um, Curtis, Ryan, Ryan, Sean, sorry. Yeah, that's, I, I have just a couple thoughts. I mean, I, I think that would be a good idea, um, but I, I want to uh, support uh, Besma's point earlier that it's um, really hard for the United States to to uh, point a finger at anybody on on democracy issues or you know uh, uh, the, given, given the issues that this country has been through in the last couple of years um, and almost losing its democracy entirely just a few months. I'm old enough to remember January when we you know, almost lost our democracy, right? So we can't really point too much, but. Um, but I do think that uh, that has also come, there, there's been pressure also from within uh, in Jordan um, and including, uh, you know, the King wrote a letter to just recently actually to, to the GID, basically suggesting, paraphrasing here, um, to, to focus on um, external security matters, counterterrorism, things like that, not on domestic politics. So as is often the case, uh, as it's kind of feels like it's the echo part of our discussion here, it's the question of the follow through. Is that going to be, is that real? Or, or was that, was that it? You know, is there, is there going to be more reform to it? Because over the years, there has been some attempt, at least at the mildest levels, to reform, change the leadership, encourage reform. But of course, it's, it's an intelligence organization. So much like its American counterparts, it's incredibly secretive uh, by definition. And we don't know uh, a lot of what's going on. I can think of other institutions, including in this country, that could use this kind of reform. And I wouldn't be able to tell you if it's happening because they're by definition secretive organizations, right? Does anyone else have anything to add on that? Um, yeah, Arwa, I, Arwa I, I, would just, I would just emphasize that. Um, I, 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 I know that in the past when USAID as part of its 
a broad portfolio of aid programming devoted to governance and democracy in Jordan, uh, whenever they've tried to approach the issue of security sector reform, um, you know, well-meaning people on the ground were frequently rebuffed because security sector reform in Jordan, uh, it's not just a matter of bureaucratically streamlining budgets and kind of redefining issue domains for competing policing and intelligence units. It really does mean wading into the royal kitchen and having to touch very sensitive political issues regarding and, and uh, about the scope of power for institutions that some, not all, but some in the Jordanian state see as the uh, the last guardian uh, for, for, for preserving Jordan, uh, which is not the discussion you want to have if you're just a middle manager, you know, promoting aid or implementing aid programs on the ground. So, I mean, I, I agree with Kurt. I think it's important to talk about security sector reform, but if there's going to be a vector for that, it's not going to come from Washington uh, for all the reasons that Vesma also mentioned. It, it, why would it come from Washington when the security and sector in Jordan is the recipient of enormous amounts of American technology, skills, aid, support, and training over the years as well. So there's no reason to reform it if American officials still need it so Jordan can serve a particular role in American grant strategy. Thank you. Um, let's try and squeeze in one more. There's a question here about the, the, the King's constant and repeated dissolution of parliament, removal of prime ministers, um, why? And how does this impact the public perception of, of government? I don't know who wants to take that. So I might not have an academic answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, there's, you know, I'm surprised not every dream has by now served in some capacity as a minister, right? I mean, it just feels like this, uh, this musical chair show. Um, Look, I mean, I think it's, um, I don't know why. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's, I think, a, a shame uh, because people are losing faith. I mean, it's back to being jaded, right? I think the average Jordanian is pretty jaded with the entire political process, um, including parliament. Um, and that's not healthy. I mean, you don't want people um, to feel jaded like it's all just a show. And that's, I think, honestly, the the biggest sentiment that, you know, the parliament is ineffective. It really is just a way to give political elites a lifetime, uh, you know, pension once they leave. It's not, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a welfare system for the elite. Um, that's what it feels like uh, on the ground. Um, and again, that's a terrible sentiment to have amongst your population, because if you lose faith in it, you're, you're not going to vote. You're not going to participate. Civic engagement goes down. Um, I mean, this is all for political scientists, the three of us that we are, I mean, you know, that's just terrible for, um, you know, the social contract, people's faith in the entire country and process. So it, it and it does, it does uh, mean we do have apathy. People don't really feel like voting matters. Um, and, you know, the, the reform process feels like another, sorry, I'm going to use the, 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 the inshallah you know, type sentiment, you know, like, yeah, down the road, inshallah, we'll do it. It, it feels like that. Um, and that really is, I think, a very sad testament to Jordanian politics. Thank you. Um, it looks like we are out of time. Um, this has been an excellent conversation. I'm so glad that we had it today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your expertise and your, your devotion to, to, to Jordan and to, uh, to studying Jordan. Um, and uh, for those of you who have joined us midway through the event, I need to just plug um, our event. Uh, you can rewatch it and you can rewatch the, the video on our website. It should be up pretty soon at pomed.org. Um, and, and thank you out in the audience for listening to, uh, to our discussion today. Thanks very much. Have a good afternoon. Bye.